Well, I don't know whether you know, but one of the challenges that we've got in our auditorium here is the acoustics. Uh, they are what you might say, too good. So if you look up at the roof, you've got uh, what they put in primary schools, for good reason, uh, to keep the volume down, to keep the noise down, which is great for a prim primary school, but sometimes it presents us a bit of a challenge because sometimes our singing kind of disappears through that very effective acoustic kind of ceiling. But I don't know what's been happening the last three weeks. I'm pretty sure no one's been up there and blocked it up. But I'm hearing you guys and our church singing uh, passionately and enthusiastically and joyfully. Um, not that we weren't doing that before, but it just seems to be a little bit more. And that's awesome. Uh, praise God. It's such an encouragement, I hope, to you as you hear the people of God around you praising the God who loves us and who we've come to worship. So keep it up, church. It's, it's super encouraging for me, at least. If I'm sure hopefully it is for others too. Um, well, we are uh, well and truly into term one. Uh, week one, term one, school's back. Holidays are over. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, maybe you're still on holidays, but for most of us, holidays are over. GBC Kids is back. There's good news uh, for you. Uh, and away we go uh, into the year. I mean, um, we've already started, but Term 1 is kind of a bit of a marking point, isn't it? Uh, one of the things that we're really hoping and praying for here at GBC in 2024 is this. We are hoping and praying that we would thrive together in Christ this year. That we would thrive together in Christ this year. We're hoping and praying for that. And we want to urge you, as the people of God here at GBC, to do the same, to pray that we would thrive together here in Christ this year. Uh, at the prayer meeting, perhaps next Monday, uh, it'd be great to come along and be praying for that, but also not just at the prayer meeting, but all the time. And what does thriving look like? Well, that we might see people rescued from sin and death through Jesus this year. We've seen that already happening, praise God, and we, are, we want to ask that that would happen all the more. That we might see one another loving God deeply from our affections, maturing in Christ together, growing to be more like Him in our godliness, uh, in our uh, maturity. That we would see each other serving Him joyfully in whatever capacity, in whatever way that, that uh, God has gifted us for. And that we might become more and more a thriving gospel community where genuine community is experienced and uh, as we come along week by week. And also that we might be on mission for Jesus wherever he has placed us throughout the week. That we would see that he has called us to be his witnesses wherever he has placed us. We're praying that these things might be true of us in ever increasing measure. And I want to ask you this question, wouldn't it be great if God answers our prayers for those things to be true of us in ever-increasing measure, they're already happening. But we want to ask that they might happen even more. So today we're starting a series kind of focusing on that, which we've called Planted, Thriving Together in Christ. Because we know for the above to hap happen, we need to be firmly planted in Jesus. And so for the next five weeks... We'll be looking at one key re reality each week of a life planted in Christ, of lives thriving in Christ together as a church, as his people. So let's get started and let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Uh, and we're going to read from verse 15 through to verse 40. Our focus is going to be on verse 34 and to 40 in particular, but for some context we'll read from verse 15 through to verse 40. And I'm going to pray, and then we'll dive into it. Matthew 22 and verse 15, I'm reading from the ESV translation. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. 
Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And so they brought him a denarius, and Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. Then the next group came and thought they'd have a crack. The same day, Sadducees came to him, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you neither know the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but God of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this gathering that we already have been blessed to be a part of. We pray that you would now take your word and bring it home to us in the power of your spirit. Lord, that we might be changed, that we might be blessed, that we might be comforted or convicted, whatever it is that we need right now in order to follow you. Please teach us, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first key reality of a life planted in Christ that we're going to look at together this morning is what we call magnification. Magnification. Uh, what do we mean by magnification? Well, what don't we mean? When we say magnification, we don't mean that it's about making something small, big, by virtue of a microscope, as a microscope makes something small visible by making it big. What we mean is making something massive visible more like the idea of a telescope. You look up to see massive planets that are not visible to the human eye, but with the help of a telescope you see something and see actually how enormous it is. And so when we talk about magnification, we're talking about seeing the greatness of Jesus to the glory of God the Father through the lens of Scripture with the help of the Holy Spirit in increasing measure. Seeing the greatness of Jesus to the glory of God the Father through the lens of Scripture with the help of the Holy Spirit in increasing measure. We're not making Jesus great. He is great already. What we are doing is we are helping one another or seeking to discover his greatness. And as we discover his greatness, seeking for us to increasingly delight in him and magnify him with our lives. So magnification is actually about our awe of God. And having seen how awesome he is and how kind he is and how gracious he is, it's about our adoration of God. It's about our 
exaltation of God, that we might boast in him and lift him up as the one who is over all and above all and more glorious than anything or anyone. It's about our affections for God, that we might love him as the one who loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And when all of that is kind of happening, it becomes about our allegiance to him, that he is our God and our king, he is Lord over our lives. And our passage makes it clear, doesn't it, why it's to be the highest priority for us. Why? Because when Jesus is pressed to to kind of outline the most important thing in all of God's word, the most, the greatest commandment, we discover that it's actually his priority for us, that we would love God with all our heart, with all our soul and with all our mind. And not only is it, we discover that it always has been. It always has been. Have a look with me again in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Remember we're told and we've seen in our reading that these questions that are being asked are not being asked by a genuine inquirer. They're being asked to test Jesus, to trap Jesus. They're being asked from a position or a disposition of malice towards Jesus and so the Pharisees have had a go and and uh, to trap Jesus in his words and failed the Sadducees have sought to trap him and he's been and they've been silenced by his response but now a Pharisee an expert in the law a lawyer steps up to the plate to test him that is an expert in God's law in the Torah in the Old Testament scriptures And here's sort of one of their heavy hitters and they bring him forward to take Jesus on. The question is around the law, isn't it? And in particular around the Ten Commandments. Which which one, Jesus, is the, you know, what is the great commandment? What are you going to say to that? You see, if they could get Jesus to somehow speak against the law, they'd have him. They'd have him. They could label him a blasphemer and they could call for his immediate death. In verse 37, Jesus responds in a way that the lawyer perhaps didn't expect. You see what he says? And he said to them, or sorry, to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. What's Jesus do here? Well, he goes to the heart of their very uh, identity as the Old Testament people of God. He quotes the Shema to him. The Shema is found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus goes to the very heart of who they are as a people. The Shema is the central confession that they would confess daily that Yahweh, capital L-O-R-D, the great and almighty God, is their God. And that he is so by redeeming love and that their response to him is to be undivided loyalty and undivided love. That they were to magnify him as they had experienced his greatness as he rescued them out of Egypt and his grace as he made covenant with them at Mount Sinai. And so this Shema was very central. In fact, they would recite it twice a day in morning and evening prayers. In verse 39, Jesus adds another commandment in response out of Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And he places it alongside the greatest commandment, making this point. That if we love God as his redeemed people in the way the Shema pictures, we'll also love others who are also made in his image and likeness. Jesus' response to the lawyer's question is remarkable, don't you think? But what he says next 
is literally mind-blowing. Do you see it there in verse 40? On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments depend or hang all the law and the prophets. What, what's Jesus saying there? That's a verse that we probably often just skip over, right? We've got the first bit. No, I'm not sure what that means. Let's just keep going. Well, what does he mean by the law and the prophets? This phrase was very much shorthand for the whole of the Old Testament. The law refers to the Pentateuch, that being the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, the writings of Moses. That's the law. And the prophets pretty much referred to everything else. So do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying the whole revelation of God in the Scriptures hang on these two commandments. Uh, that is, the, this is what the whole biblical story revealed in the Scriptures is about. It's actually, about, it's actually what life is about as revealed in the law and the prophets. That it's about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength vertically and loving others who are made in God's image horizontally. See, what do we discover when we open the pages of the law, the first five books of the Bible? Well, we discover, don't we, that our very existence comes from God. And we're made in His image. We discover that He is the one true God and that we are created to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. We discover that we were made to love Him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and that this is God's design for us. And it's God's design for us to love others who also bear His image. And so as we think about magnifying Jesus to the glory of God today, as we think about discovering His greatness and delighting in it today, here are two foundational realities that we see in the way Jesus alludes to the law and the prophets that are summarised, if you like, in these two commandments that he gave. Firstly, magnification is what you were made for and what God is worthy of. Magnification is what you were made for and what God is worthy of. As Jesus reveals the greatest commandment, he knows this to be true. This is what's revealed to us in the law and the prophets and crystallised in these commandments. Because from the first page, as we've already said, we encounter the God who made the world and everything in it. We encounter the God who made us in his own image and likeness. And we discover, when we discover the God who made us, we discover why we exist. We discover our purpose in life. We discover that we were created to be worshippers and to magnify the one who made the world and who made us. And we discover as we open the pages of Scriptures, don't we, the God who is worthy of this. The eternal God who was and is and is to come. What are the first few verses in Genesis? In the beginning, God. Before there was anything or anyone in the beginning, God. The eternal God. Worthy of the praises of all that he makes. We discover that he is the one who spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be, and there was. We encounter the one who gave us life and breath and all things. Who does that? The one who made us in his image and likeness. Who does that? Only God does that. Is it any wonder that when Jesus answers the question, what is the greatest commandment? He says what he says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind 
And is it any wonder that the second commandment would be like it? That you would love your neighbor as yourself? Is it any wonder that we are called to love God in this vertical relationship and love others in these horizontal relationships? On these two commandments, Jesus says, depends all the law and the prophets. Friends, it's what we were made for. And it's what God is worthy of. Uh, A favourite author of mine uh, kind of pictures this in this way. uh, And I've quoted this to you before. His name is Paul Tripp. Uh, You can read any of his books. I recommend all of them. Um, He says this about us. We are hardwired for awe as people made in God's image. We are hardwired for awe. We are meant to be and made to be in awe of something or someone. And at the end of the day, there is only one who is truly awesome. We've used that word a lot, don't we now? You know, we have a good, good food, we're like, awesome. We could reserve it in a sense for the one we encounter as we open the law. The God who is truly awesome and in whom we are to be in awe of. David puts it this way in Psalm 34 verse 1 to 3, when he's responding to this awesome God, I will bless the Lord. There it is again, L-O-R-D, capital, at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. And then he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Why? Why? Because it's what we were made for and it's because he is worthy of it. Secondly, when it comes to magnifying Jesus, it's what we have fallen, sorry, typo, from, but it's what God redeems us to. It's what we have fallen from, and it's what God redeems us to. Again, you don't have to go far in the law and the prophets to see this, do you? Just a couple of chapters in, after this beautiful start, this glorious beginning, this amazing purpose that we have as people made in the image and likeness of God. Just a couple of chapters in and humans tragically turn their backs on God's good design. We see people no longer exalting God, but rather exalting themselves. We, people, we see people no longer living out what they were made for, but living for themselves. And as the biblical story unfolds, we see the magnification of false gods and idols of every kind. We see the worship of false gods and not the true and living God. And we see God bringing his just and righteous judgment as a result. We see the fracturing of human relationships, of horizontal relationships. We see jealousy. We see hatred. We see murder. We see the expression of every form of sin and evil. And it appears that all is lost. Just a few pages in to the law. Humanity has fallen. Tragically fallen from what it was made for, from God's good design. And the tragedy, sorry, the tragic realities of this are with us to this very day, aren't they? Not exalting God, but exalting ourselves. 
not living for God, but living for ourselves. All sorts of relational dysfunction and, and bitterness and hatred and, yeah, murder. The, the reality, the confronting reality, is that these are present in us because we have all done this. We have all turned our backs on God's good design. Not just the people we read about in the first pages of the Bible. We've all done it. We've all fallen from it. We've all exalted other gods in our lives, whatever form they might take. Putting them in front of God and giving them priority over God. We've all created our own purpose for our own life, running our own life our own way. And therefore we are all worthy of God's just and righteous judgment as a result. It's what we've fallen from. God's good and grand design for our lives. But that's not all we see in the Law and the Prophets, is it? What we also see is a God who takes the initiative to redeem those who have fallen. We see a God who sets a plan in motion to bring salvation to his world, to his fallen world. In the Old Testament, we see it foreshadowed, but in the Lord Jesus, as we heard earlier, we see it fulfilled. Come, behold the wondrous mystery. Jesus himself said when he came, for the Son of Man came to save, sorry, to seek and to save the lost. That's us. And in Romans 3, we see God fulfilling his saving plan in Jesus making atonement for us. That though we have turned our backs on him, he provides for our redemption at great cost to himself. Have a look at Romans 3. There it is, verse 23. For all have sinned, not just them, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom we put forward. No, no, no. Whom God put forward as a propitiation for our sins by his blood to be received by faith. God takes the initiative to redeem us from where we fell. But what I also want us to see this morning as we think about magnification is where that lands us when God saves us. Just look with me a few chapters later in Romans. Romans 12, 1 and 2, perhaps very familiar. Paul writes, I appeal to you or I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And at that moment, in the context of this whole biblical story, we ought to be saying, what? Really? I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is what? Which is your spiritual worship. What are, you, what are you saying, Paul? Are you saying this has been restored to us? That's precisely what he's saying. And he urges us by the mercies of God, which is his way of summarising all that God has done for us in Jesus in this atoning work and rescuing us and making us new through his resurrection. He's saying, by all of that, I urge you in response to that, offer yourself. Your bodies, which is another way of saying heart, soul, mind, everything, all of you. 
You see what we have here? You see what God has done in our lives through his son if we've come to him. He has redeemed you and in doing so he has redeemed your worship. He has restored you to what you were made for and for what he, was, he is worthy of. And by his, by his mercy in Jesus, he has brought you to a place of magnifying him and doing so with your whole life or your heart, soul, mind and strength. Not perfectly, but authentically, which includes coming and confessing when you failed, but also pursuing him in a way that you would never have otherwise. It's what we've fallen from, but it's what God redeems us to. So if you're a Christian here this morning, if he's redeemed you, then he's redeemed you that you might worship him with your life. That you might cease to run things your way. That you might re-enter God's good design for you as someone made in his image and likeness. That you might love him with your heart, soul, mind and strength and you might love others as yourself in a way that would otherwise be impossible but now by the grace of God can be a reality. Again, not perfection in this life. It's, it's about the direction of our lives, not the perfection of our lives. Now, I'm sure if you've watched enough TV, you'll realise that there are that many restoration reality TV shows. There's houses, there's cars, there's backyards, there's pools, and the list goes on and on and on. And I, I, must, I just conclude by that it must mean there is something about restorations that we like. And I get it. And I'm sure you do too. But do you see this morning the restoration that God has done in his son, in your life. The restoration of his glorious purpose, which he has for you through Jesus. The God-given purpose that you and I were made for and that he's worthy of. Magnifying Jesus to the glory of God the Father, discover, discovering in increasing measure His greatness, delighting in Him more and more deeply over time and devoting yourself to Him more fully in response. It's what we've fallen from, but it's what God redeems us to. And this, friends, again, is what we want to continue to pursue together this year here at GBC. This is what we want to pursue together as people thriving in Christ. As people who are planted deeply in Him together. And I just want to give you a number of practical exhortations, I suppose, or encouragements. Ways to do that. And here they are. Firstly, I want to encourage you to gather together consistently and regularly. To gather together as God's people consistently and regularly. To magnify the Lord and exalt His name. Gather together regular and consistently. But also, when, when you do gather, I want to also encourage you to do it prayerfully and intentionally. Not accidentally. Come prayerfully. Come with a prayerful heart that God might plant you and others around you more deeply in Christ that day. Come prayerfully and come because you've come to receive what theologians call the means of grace. That is, the ways that God has set things up for you to receive His grace in your life in a daily, weekly way. That is, through the 
preaching of God's word opened up and applied and brought home to you by the Holy Spirit, through the singing of God's praises by the people of God that you are a part of, through gathering around the Lord's table where you remind yourself of his death and resurrection for you and by taking the bread and the juice you, you remind yourself of your need of it and your participation in it by faith through the encouragement of others, both before and after the gathering, as you think about what has been the subject of our gathering that particular day. Receiving the means of grace, thankfully and dependently. You know, like we actually need it, because we do. And God has graciously provided those things for us that we might be planted, that we might thrive, not individually on our own, but together in Christ. So gather together, grow with others, find a way to meet together with someone or a bunch of people to increasingly discover and delight in who Jesus is. Grow with others. Firstly, gather together. Secondly, grow with others. Thirdly, give generously. Give generously. Now, that might seem like a little bit of an odd one in this whole area, but let me, let me explain why it's there. It's there because Jesus said these words. You cannot serve or worship God and money. So we're talking about magnification, which is about worshipping God. And so do you know what our giving does for us? It does lots of things, but one of the things it does, it keeps a check on our hearts. It keep, it's like a health check. It checks for the little kind of idols that start to grow up in our hearts. And they are many and varied and multiple, and they keep happening. And so giving actually keeps plucking them out just by virtue of letting go of things that we might otherwise held on to. Thirdly, give testimony. Give testimony. Share with others what the Lord is teaching you or showing you in his word or what he's doing in your life, how he's encouraging you, sustaining you. That, that is such an encouragement to others as we seek to magnify Jesus together, to hear Oh, wow, you've been through a really tough time, but you were able to lean on Jesus and you felt that was just brutal what you went through. He sustained you in it. Or, you know, he's shown me something wonderful that I hadn't seen before in his word. Or, I was able to share the gospel with someone the other day and they seemed you know, quite interested and I'm praying for them. Share, give testimony to what the Lord is doing in your life. Serve joyfully is the last one. You know, serve in the Bible, the word is actually part of the word family for worship. It's not doing a task. It's not doing a job. It's not fulfilling a roster. That's not how the Bible sees ministry and serving. It sees it as worship. Whether you're helping in kids, leading in kids, serving in music, on the door, whatever it is, morning tea, it's worship. Which is how you can do it joyfully. <laughs> if you just do it as a task, mm, that's a lot of fun. But if it's worship, wow, that changes it, doesn't it? So serve joyfully. Magnification, discovering his greatness. And not just discovering it, but delighting in it. And then devoting yourself to him. It's what you were made for. It's what God is worthy of. It's what we have all fallen from, but it's what God redeems us to. So as we close, let's close with the exhortation and the encouragement, if you like. The strong encouragement of King David again. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. 
Let the humble hear and be glad. And wouldn't this be good to say to one another every time we gathered, Oh, brothers and sisters, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us in the Lord Jesus. We thank you so much that your good design is best by far. You have made us for yourself. You have given us a glorious purpose for our lives, that we might love you and live for you in your world, that we might be image bearers in your world, Lord, that we might magnify you, delight in you, serve you, exalt you, and so much more. And Father, we would confess this morning how often we lose sight of that or even turn away from it to other things, to things that are poor counterfeits, false idols or gods that we think will give us meaning and purpose but end up only diminishing who we are as you have made us. We thank you, Lord, that we have done that. You have not let us go. You have pursued us in your Son and through him you have done everything for us necessary for us to be made right with you and to be restored to you and to be renewed by you Father, how good have you been to us in your Son. May we, with your mercies clearly in view, even today, even as we sing this last song, freshly offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you, as our spiritual worship because we should but especially because we can because of what you've done for us in Jesus your rich mercy towards us in him and it's his, in his name we pray Amen